Hello, everyone. Good evening to everyone. I think you all are very well and in very good mental health and well in very good, condi good condition. So today, uh, this is the third day of our webinar series. Uh, we, the Izoha team, maintained a three-day webinar series in this One Health Day. Today is the last day of our webinar series. As a third day, uh, our webinar theme is One Health Day Student Advocacy. So welcome everyone to our today's session. Uh, I think you everyone is hearing me well and our presentation is going to start soon. First of all, I'm going to introduce myself. Uh, this is Mohammed Anisur Rahman from Faculty of Veterinary Animal and Biomedical Sciences, uh, Bangladesh. And uh, I am one of the webinar planner of this IZOHA Educational Committee for 2020 and 21 team. And along with me, my colleague Carla Lopez is also in present here. She is from the university, she is from also University of, uh, from Ecuador and her university name is University San Francisco de Esculto. She is a medical student uh, from Ecuador. And here uh, we have uh, also present uh, Izoha president Andres Papas as he is the president of this Izoha uh, team. And I would like to uh, introduce himself as if uh, say something in front of you guys. Hello. Hello. I hope you can hear me. Yeah, Andres. So welcome everybody to this webinar. So thank you very much for doing this nice introduction. And uh, I'm very proud for Izoha and very happy that we have today our last part of this series. And I want to tell you that we are here to help you as much as we can and to, do, to make our goals happen. So we are trying to educate you and to bring you together all together. Uh, so, uh, we have tried to make to do many steps for this year to try to develop new ways to to make our goals happen so this is one of them today and uh, we are planning to have some more during the rest of the term so welcome again everybody to this session i wish you to to have a nice time and to be educated from this part and uh, i wish you all have a nice and uh, Actually, I want to, be, to ask you to be patient with this COVID situation. Try to do your best. And I know that you all know in your heart what is the reality and what you should do. So just follow your heart and I'm, I'm sure that you'll do the best. Have a nice webinar. Thank you, Andres. Uh, thank you for your good words. Uh, now uh, I'm going to introduce our today's uh, speaker from uh, a very good institution and they will uh, share your, their thoughts with us today and now uh, our first speaker is uh, Bailey Archie she is the VP of our Izoha educational team and she is a third year veterinary student at Mississippi State University in the United States and studied animal science there for her undergraduate degree during college, she gained a deep appreciation for the role animal agriculture plays in food security and in global trade. This led to her interest in One Health, and her long-term goal is to be involved in applying One Health efforts towards agricultural policy. After spending time in large animal private practice, she has experience interning with the United States Department of Agriculture and has advocated to United States federal law marks for One Health legislation. So she is one of our speakers and she will talk about the student advocacy and One Health issue. Uh, so welcome her 
uh, in this session and thank you for participating with us. And here, our another speaker, Neil Viju, I'm also welcoming him uh, as Neil Viju is a final year veterinary student at Iowa State University and concurrent master of a public health student at the University of Iowa. As an undergraduate, he studied animal science, microbiology, and emerging global diseases at Iowa State. His undergraduate research in the lab and otherwise focused on antimicrobial resistance. As an undergraduate, he founded one of two veterinarians without borders student organization on the continent. Through his group, Neil discovered his passion for One Health. He went on to found the Iowa One Health Conference, IOHC, in 2016 and lead the planning of its info internationally award-winning 2017 follow-up during which he worked with the Iowa governor's office to declare an Iowa One Health Month. Continuing in, in One Health leadership, Neil served as 2017-18 vice president at large and 2018-19 president of the International Student One Health Alliance. He is now as an Izoha trustee. He wa his work in Izoha has focused on creating a framework for the expanding global students One Health Network. Neil has spoken worldwide about his patience in advocacy, One Health, antimicrobial resistance, and Neil serves on an ad hoc advocacy team working to implement One Health related policy in the United States at the federal level. More recent work of Neil focuses on raising awareness for the burden of suicide shared by the different clinical professions. So he co-created the first clinician suicide awareness day, a collaboration between major US health student organization. Neil is preparing for a career in global health policy and the animal environmental human interface. So we welcome Neil Vizu in today's session. And now we are going to start our today's webinar session and I'm going to pass my screen to our first speaker, Bailey Archie. And welcome Bailey Archie and please start your presentation to our uh, all participants. Thank you, everyone. Yes, I'm seeing this. Great, Anitha, I think we're getting some feedback noise on your end. There we go, that sounds good. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we're still getting some noise, Anitha. Oh, this is uh, the uh, sound from our mic. The Ajan is happening now. Yes. <laughs> Uh, Islam, uh, as Islamic country, we have Ajan in five times in our country. So this is the uh, last Ajan in our country. As a Muslim, okay, cool. you know. Can you just that... mute yourself for now? Uh, yeah, sure, sure. Cool, thank you. Okay, hey everyone, I'm Bailey Archie and I'm the VP of Education for ISOHA this year. And I just wanted to share a little bit about my one Health journey um, and how I've been fortunate to have some opportunities in One Health advocacy. And hopefully that can ins inspire you to um, take advantage of similar opportunities or sort of forge your own opportunities during the time of COVID. And so this is just a brief outline of things I want to talk about. And I also just want to emphasize that my experience is sort of US centric and uh, veterinary centric. So I hope that um, you'll be able to find ways to apply this to your own profession or country. Um, you know, don't think that you have to be a veterinary student 
or lived in the United States um, to get involved in advocacy. So a little bit about me and my One Health journey. Um, I just think it's cool to kind of look back on how you beca first became passionate about One Health uh, because that will sort of motivate you to share why One Health is important um, with your lawmakers or your family or friends or whoever your advocacy audience is. Um, so I've known, I knew for a while that I wanted to go to veterinary school. Um, and when I was in college, like Anissa said, I um, got interested in animal agriculture. I wasn't initially interested in that, but um, I appreciated kind of the economics behind it and the role that it plays in global trade and food security. Um, and a motto that our Undersecretary of Agri Agriculture in the United States um, always shares is that food security is national security. So I came across this article called Want to Keep America Safe? Train More Veterinarians. Um, and it was a few months before I started vet school. And it was the first time that I realized um, that as a veterinarian, I could protect public health and national security. And I was just very uh, inspired and empowered by that. So that um, was kind of my first exposure to the One Health concept, even though this article doesn't really mention One Health by name. Um, and it was written by Dr. Krista Gallagher, who is a professor at Ross University Vet School in the Caribbean. And I actually got to connect with her um, recently this year for something else, which I'll touch on later. Um, and then also before I was starting vet school, I came across the work of Dr. Barbara Natterson Horowitz, who's a physician um, and done a lot of work with comparative medicine and advocated for a One Health approach to that. And I just appreciated her sentiment that, um, you know, veterinarians are doctors too, because I think that's something that is forgotten, um, at least in my community. I'm not sure about yours, but I just appreciated, um, you know, someone from the human medical profession saying, hey, veterinarians have a lot that they can contribute um, to human health. So um, I was in my second year of vet school and sort of had this One Health lens in mind. I knew I was interested in One Health and maybe working for federal government or policy eventually. And I had the opportunity to attend a um, convention of the American Veterinary Medical Association in Washington, DC. And at that meeting, I attended a session where Neil Vizzo, uh, our other speaker today, was speaking and it was called Advocacy in Action. And it was basically just about how to advocate um, to federal government or even just local state government for One Health and other issues of importance to the veterinary profession. Um, so we're in good hands with Neil today. He'll have a lot of insight to share with us. Um, but later on at that convention, I just went up to Neil and introduced myself because I was interested in One Health. And he told me that the International Student One Health Alliance um, was probably going to have some opportunities coming up soon for me to get involved. And uh, it was actually in the airport on my way back from that meeting that I applied to be part of the ISOHA Educational Committee for last year. So I spent last year as the event manager, mainly managing our webinars. Um, and then through ISOHA, I've had the opportunity to, you know, grow as a leader and work on my professional development and network and meet people from all over the world. So basically I just share that story to say that you never know um, where you know attending a meeting or going up and introducing yourself to somebody might lead. Um, and then a few months after that meeting, I had the opportunity to go back to the Washington DC area, which is the capital of the United States and work with our Department of Agriculture 
um, in a branch called the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service. And basically, I researched the status of OIE listed aquatic diseases in the US. So the OIE, um, many of you might know, is the World Organization for Animal Health. And basically, as countries update the OIE on the status of animal diseases in their country, they're able to maintain the integrity um, and transparency in global trade. So even though I wasn't really working with zoonotic diseases in that capacity, I still felt like that was a One Health opportunity um, since global trade is an important part of the One Health equation, um, just through the ways that it provides animal protein and economic opportunity to people. So I'll backtrack a little bit and um, talk about ISOHA for a minute, just so everyone can kind of get a refresher and an update since we have changed some of our officers and we have two new committees. So as you probably know, we aim to connect, create resources, and promote the One Health concept to students globally, irrespective of their field of study. And so here are our EXCO members, and um, these members were introduced a few months ago through some of our announcements, but we're excited to welcome Sean Sam as our new VP of Outreach, and he's a veterinary student at the Royal Veterinary College in the UK. And we also have two great educational, well, we have two committees, educational committee and marketing committee. So I've enjoyed working with the educational committee and they've been doing a lot of great work so far, including things like our webinars, our mentorship program and our educational journal and establishing a new lesson leaders program with onehealthlessons.com. So this is just a list of our programs and resources, and I can send this out after the webinar in case you're interested in checking them out. Um, so hopefully the resources sheet will be valuable to everyone because um, we get a lot of requests for help on how to start a one, how to start a One Health club um, or looking for educational opportunities, and so. Hopefully these things will be helpful to everyone. So something that I think is important to remember about advocacy is that it doesn't just have to be governmental or on a legislative basis. You know, that's really exciting if you get the opportunity to do that. And I love being involved in that realm, but the most important kind of advocacy is um, adv advocating to future generations so that hopefully they can take a One Health approach um, to the way that they live um, and the way that they make decisions as you know future lawmakers and de decision makers in our world. So ISOHA has teamed up with OneHealthLessons.com which was created by Dr. Deborah Thompson, who um, is a veterinarian who has spent time um, working in a congressional office in the United States as well. Um, but she believes in the importance of education. And so she has this awesome website with free One Health lessons available for anybody to teach. And so basically her group is leveraging the existing network of ISOHA in order to help build a strong force of people, particularly students, since, you know, is so high student-based, um, to teach her lessons. So you can visit this link down here in order to check out more about the program and apply, but that's a great opportunity um, to get involved in advocacy from an educational standpoint. So I'll talk a little bit about my advocacy experience. I'm going to start with my advocate, advocacy experience in government. But like I just mentioned, I think it's important to remember that advocacy can take lots of different forms. So I'm going to talk about advocacy um, through my personal life and personal decisions and interaction with friends and family as well. 
And like I said earlier, my experience is, you know, U.S. centric and veterinary centric. But just remember, you don't have to be in the U.S. and you don't have to be a veterinary student in order to be a One Health advocate. So my favorite um, advocacy experience and probably most significant one politically that I've had was getting to attend the American Veterinary Medical Association's fly-in this past February. So the fly-in is basically where people from all over the U.S. fly to Washington, D.C., the capital, and they get to talk to the lawmakers that represent their states about issues that matter to them. So the One Health issues that we were talking about at this fly-in were a bill, um, a piece of proposed legislation called the Advancing Emergency Preparedness Through One Health Act of 2019. And then we were also advocating for the National Animal Health Laboratory Network appropriations. So basically, advocating for them to get their full funding from the federal government so that they can protect animal health and subsequently protect human health as well. And also some of those animal health laboratories across the U.S. have been really involved in COVID testing, um, which we didn't know at this time of this event that COVID was going to be such a big deal. But since then, those animal health laboratory network or the labs in that network um, have been really important in the COVID response, um, surveillance and testing in the U.S. So at this event, before we were all sent to talk to our lawmakers that represent us, we had two veterinarians in Congress, Representatives Ted Yoho and Kurt Schrader, talk to us. And these representatives introduced um, the One Health Act in the U.S. House of Representatives. And they basically talked about their experience as veterinarians involved in policy and involved in the federal government. And they gave us some insight and wisdom and knowledge and, you know, told us how to better convey our message. And something that they emphasized, which I think is important, is to use um, personal anecdotes or stories when talking to a lawmaker, um, if you have any that you think will be effective. So I just put this in here as a reminder that um, you can use the knowledge and experience of other people um, in your advocacy journey. So you don't have to go at it alone. Um, there may be, you know, if you're a student, there may be professionals in your area who are also involved in One Health advocacy or have had experiences similar to the ones that you're looking for. So just remember that there are people that have gone before you and who you can try to emulate in your advocacy. So I had the opportunity to meet one of my senators and one of my, or my one representative and I primarily focused on the One Health Act. So that was a piece of legislation introduced in both of our houses of Congress in the US. And you can see brief little snippets of the legislation here. But basically I you know, sort of tailored my advocacy to the fact that my state, the state that they're representing, is a major poultry producer in the U.S. And then I also talked about how this legislation would be beneficial to my veterinary school since my representative, representative guest, is the congressman for the area where my veterinary school is. So like I said, Mississippi is a big poultry producing state and we know that there are a lot of opportunities for zoonotic diseases, from poultry, um, you know, avian influenza can be devastating to industry, but uh, depending on the form, avian influenza can also infect people. And then Mississippi is also a large egg processing state. And so I talked about how eggs are often used to make human vaccines. 
and then I talked with Representative Guest about how our veterinary school will basically be sort of given more recognition or there will be more opportunities for graduates from that veterinary school if the One Health approach is further adopted in, um, in U.S. policy and legislation. So basically this One Health Act just tells our federal government that they need to coordinate among the many different branches of government to figure out how they can better work together as a One Health unit because there are a lot of different branches of the government that are separately involved in One Health activities, but they're not always communicating with each other and not always coming up with a coordinated action plan. So, um, and also I'll say that Senator Hyde Smith spent time as the Commissioner of Agriculture for the state of Mississippi. So the poultry industry was very important to her and she was Agriculture Commissioner for the state during the avian influenza outbreak that happened several years prior. And so she said that um, the fear of avian influenza getting to Mississippi would keep her up at night. And so it was just important to bring that up so that that One Health concept could really hit home with her. So I think that everyone cares about One Health if it's from a you know agricultural standpoint or through um, helping to uplift educational institutions in your area or you know whether it's through like a wildlife disease standpoint or water quality or soil health you know we all know that One Health is really all-encompassing so I think that people care about it even if they don't know uh, what it is called if they even if they've never heard the word One Health. So I also got the opportunity to write a little article for the Council for Agricultural Science and Technology. And um, I titled this slide Ad Advocacy because um, I was talking basically about agriculture in this article, um, but also sort of in the form of advo advo advocacy, excuse me. So um, this group called CAST sends out weekly emails, you know, updating people on current trends and news in agriculture. And they were asking for short stories or anecdotes from people who had any experience or ideas of why there is a food animal veterinarian shortage in the United States. And so basically I emailed them back and just gave them, you know, my opinions that I want to be involved in food animal production uh, because I think that it's a form, ultimately a form of national security. And I talked about how I want to be involved in animal agriculture, even though it's under scrutiny for its public health and environmental health impacts. Um, so basically through this, I was able to tie, through writing this article, I was able to talk about One Health um, and also talk about why I want to be involved in food animal medicine, even though it is sometimes put under the microscope um, in a negative way. I just basically talked about how, you know, nothing can change unless people get involved in it. So that was sort of another advocacy opportunity that wasn't um, directed at lawmakers or anything like that. But I was able to share this with my family and friends and hopefully some other people read it in as well and were able to hear me talk about One Health. So subscribe to emails of importance to you. You never know. Um, they might ask you to write a piece for their website if you uh, just give them some feedback on, on things that they're looking for. And kind of going off of the agriculture thing, something I'm personally really interested in is regenerative agriculture, which is basically the idea that agriculture, when done in a certain way, can restore our soils and the soils can then sequester carbon and um, provide a 
solution or mitigation um, to climate change. So I have always been, you know, in the past couple of years since I found out about it, really uh, interested in regenerative agriculture. And so I went on a family trip to Texas a couple months ago, and I knew that there was a ranch nearby called Rome Ranch where they graze bison. Um, and their bison is managed holistically. And I just always thought it was really cool. And so I told my family, hey, let's go to Rome Ranch. It looks really neat. And so basically through visiting this ranch, um, we were able to, as a family, learn more about One Health because regenerative agriculture is sort of the one, like one perfect One Health example. So you have animals being managed in a holistic way who, through their grazing and through their management, um, can sequester carbon from the atmosphere, so improving the environment. And then those animals then can provide a source of safe and healthy protein to people. So I was basically able to share that with my family through simply suggesting that we go visit this ranch on a family trip. And also because of my interest in regenerative agriculture, I'm trying to make some changes in my own personal life and consumer behavior. So um, when I can, as much as I can, I try to buy meat from the company called Force of Nature, which works with this ranch that I visited. And Force of Nature sources meat raised in a regenerative way from all over the world, and then they ship it out to people so that they can um, have confidence and trust in the meat that they are eating. So um, that's just a way that I gear my own spending towards um, you know something that I believe in. So all of this is to say that um, the things that you buy and the things that you talk about with friends and family and even activities that you do with your friends and family can be directed in a One Health approach and can be done in the light of One Health. So there are so many ways to bring One Health advocacy into your personal life as well. And I think that that's ultimately where it starts. You know, if you're not a One Health advocate in your personal life, it's gonna be hard to advocate for it um, to your lawmakers or on a federal level. So for everyone who wants to become a One Health advocate, I think it's really important to just seize every opportunity that you can. It's hard to do that during COVID, um, but hopefully toward, at the end of the session, um, I plan on giving you guys some more ideas on how you can make the most of opportunities during COVID. Um, reach out and make connections. You know, email people um, who are in positions that you are interested in. And remember that baby steps are important as well. So me just introducing myself to Neil at that convention um, was basically the foundation of me being involved in ISOHA and having the position that I do now. So you never know where just reaching out may lead you. Use your resources and people who can help you. So chances are there um, are people already working in One Health advocacy in your area. If there's not, you can be the first one and that would be great. But um, there are people who can help you and provide resources and and advice as well. So be sure to use their abilities to your advantage. Practice with your immediate audience, like your friends and family. Talk about One Health at the dinner table or on family trips. And also use your personal decisions as a form of advocacy um, because advocacy ultimately starts in your personal life and Advocacy is also um, rooted in education. So through educating your friends and family and through using your personal decisions as a form of advocacy, you can become better prepared to be a advocate um, in the government space. So I think that is all I have. Here's my contact information. So feel free to reach out to me if you need any more advice. Uh, I hope that was encouraging to everyone um, that you are capable of being a One Health advocate.
So I will now pass the screen off to Neil. Hey, can everybody uh, hear and see me and my screen? Yep. Excellent. All right, sorry for the wait, guys. Um, so I'm gonna be basically building on what Bailey has been talking about. Uh, in five years, you can, you can probably think of me as probably a, a budget store brand Bailey with regard to all of these things. She's um, made quite had quite a go um even with her uh even though having less time in vet school than i have so it's great to have her here as well anyways my brief history of advocacy um a lot of overlap with with bailey um i was really introduced to legislative advocacy in 2015 with a with a sort of initiative that we'll go into later at the state level um and I did an internship in uh, the U.S. Senate for one summer uh, and uh, quite a few other things here uh, that we'll go into in further detail further on. Um, anyways, there's different kinds of advocacy, uh, as Bailey pointed out, and you'll find that uh, once you further study and read about advocacy. So uh, we just want you to be prepared for that. Um, there's self-advocacy, which is representing your own interests and views. There's individual advocacy um, in which you're speaking on behalf of others. And then there's systems advocacy, which is probably the more formal legislative advocacy where you go and talk to lawmakers about issues and uh, hope to create or change legislation or policy that currently exists. As far as the advocacy journey, these are kind of the basic steps for uh, what to do that are widely agreed upon to be the basically the things that you do in starting any advocacy adventure uh, first of all you need to identify a problem i mean this this world is is full of them of course so there's plenty to to sort of zero in on and you just need to pick out one or a few that you are very passionate about and think you can make a change with uh, once that's done you want to assemble your core advocacy team and you want to formulate possible solutions, identify your stakeholders and engage them, um, and make your plan, set SMART goals, which we'll go into later, then do actually do your campaign, and then evaluate how that all went. Anyways, uh, more about identifying the problem. Th these are just various things you consider right here, that you consider. Uh, first of all, is there little awareness of One Health in your region? That's a very sort of low-hanging fruit, so to speak, for um, advocating about simply bringing up awareness of One Health. Um, is your government not using an integrated One Health approach? That's a little bit more technical and probably would require uh, some people with technical expertise in the government um, and in perhaps disease surveillance uh, to find out exactly where those gaps are and then uh, try and plug them but uh, it's still something that is possible. Um, and are, are there relationships between health researchers that can be catalyzed? Um, and, and that's something that was actually kind of solved with one of our Iowa One Health conferences that was briefly discussed previously. Um, also, there's an advocacy effort already ongoing that you know about if, if some of your professors, um, just mentors or friends are involved in 
uh, any sort of advocacy campaign or any sort of um, interest group that you think is a good idea, you can join in. You don't have to reinvent the wheel or you know start your own thing. If you do start your own thing, you're going to want to assemble your own team. Uh, and that needs to be a close group of people that you can trust and depend on. That's, that's really pertinent. Somebody or some group of people who you can depend on basically to get back to you and not uh, flake on you, so to speak, um, and who you know will get the job done. And uh, lots of times that'll be close friends, and that's often the, the best case scenario if you have close friends who are also passionate uh, and also very competent with everything that this will require. But sometimes um, it'll require a bit of outreach, uh, connecting some dots and connecting with people to find the right people to be on your team. Uh, and it's really important to emphasize that if you are starting out your own advocacy effort, uh, it's normally not something you want to go alone. You will usually or almost always want friends to be there with you. Uh, also, this could be the beginning of a coalition building process uh, or stakeholder building process as well. So it's not necessarily going to be exactly in that order that we laid out in previous slides uh, every time. As far as formulating possible solutions, that's, again, it can be an incredibly complex process that can be occurring at really any step of those eight that we lined out. Um, and it may be very slow. Again, a lot of times it takes some technical expertise to find out where the gaps are. Um, just like there's gaps in, in research or in, in the literature in science, um, there are these gaps in society as well. So um, whereas a researcher might you know, start a project to find out something that we simply don't know yet, uh, there are also you know, projects or advocacy initiatives to be started to address problems that haven't been solved yet. And that's where you all can come in. Uh, and it's a lot of the time though, it's even harder to, once you've identified a gap, to find realistic solutions that are you know, actionable and can be feasibly done that haven't already been tried, but uh, there certainly are uh, there certainly are these possibilities to go forward, and it's happening all the time. Um, and again, it may require some expert consultation. Um, it, it may require people with expertise on your team, or actually, it should. Um, but you might need to reach out to people who are not students um, and get them to to back you up. And that would actually give you more legitimacy in really anything that you're doing if you have some. A uh, professional uh, organization or or non-students on board as well. Uh, as far as state stakeholder analysis and stakeholder outreach, um, any of these people could consist of uh, student organizations, um, non-governmental organizations, uh, ministries, uh, ministers, and other policymakers, um, as well as, of course, like your university. Um, or academic institutions or research institutions in general. And in a nutshell, stakeholders are people who you think would have, really anyone who you think would have an interest in what you're trying to do, um, and people that you will want to be, be aware of and sort of keep tabs on um, or check in on regularly. And there's this chart right here um, that's about stakeholder management. Uh, anyways, there's basically this spectrum of people who have uh, low to high power and who have low to high interest. And if someone has a lot of power and also a lot of interest in the issue, uh, say that they're, you know, the lawmakers themselves, a really important professional society in your country, um, you're going to want to work with them and manage them very closely because uh, you're, you're going to want to keep them happy, more or less. Um, if they're not very interested but are powerful, you just want to make sure you don't cross them uh, and make them mad because they could potentially shut you down like right away. Uh, if they have not a whole lot of power but um, could in mass potentially uh, really help out your campaign, then you'll want to basically keep them informed of what you're doing um, and then whatever they can do for you might arise with time. Um, and just low, low interest, low power, just keep an eye on them 
and make sure you know what they're up to with regards to what you're trying to do. As far as uh, finding potential uh, coalition members, uh, you have friends. You may, you may have friends already in, in whatever effort you try and pursue. Uh, there's this thing called the World Health Students Alliance that consists of uh, the International Veterinary Student Association, the International Federation of Medical Students Associations, uh, as well as their dental and pharmacy student equivalents. And uh, they have, you know, chapters in almost every country. So if you're taking uh, a student youth health approach to something that you want to do, there's a very good chance that uh, it's at least worth reaching out to them and that they might want to be involved as well because um, these organizations are very well resourced, uh, very well structured, and would just be good partners in general for uh, any of a variety of endeavors. Anyways, when you make your advocacy, your advocacy plan and timeline, you're going to want to make what's known as a SMART plan, and that means it needs to be specific. You can, you can briefly and succinctly state what you want to do. Uh, it needs to be measurable. Uh, so even if it's something very subjective, um, you might want to be able to say, we want to increase uh, or we want to we want to decrease the prevalence of rabies by this much, or we want to increase the uh, amount of knowledge displayed by this much in this group of people. Uh, and it's also very important that you have realistic and achievable goals that are relevant to the issue um, and make sense for whoever you're trying to pitch it to. And you need to have a timeline for it as well. That's really important. Um, if you don't set a timeline or if you don't set a time frame for things, then um, things kind of just tend to get put aside. You know, just like any school assignment, um, you're gonna like rush to the finish sometimes at the end and you need to put that pressure on yourself too if you wanna get things done uh, properly. Anyways, campaigning. Uh, for legislative advocacy, this would consist of contacting lawmakers and speaking to them about uh, any given issue. Some of the lowest hanging fruit as far as campaigning is having a social media campaign and writing letters to the editor and press releases. And a lot of times there's no real reason that you shouldn't do those unless it's just not at all worth the effort for whatever reason. Uh, but we're gonna have further examples of uh, letters to the editor and press releases in uh, pictures and links that are coming up. So that, those will give you some good bases on which to build. Uh, putting flyers in public spaces uh, is great, of course. Um, also giving lectures, putting on conferences, conference series, um, and also making uh, how-to guides for uh, accomplishing things so you can more wide, make your efforts more widespread. As far as going to social media promotion really quickly, I just want to say, use Hootsuite. Um, it makes life just so much easier. It lets you link three accounts, uh, social media accounts in the free version, and you can schedule up to 30 posts. Um, I am absolutely not being paid by them uh, to say this, but uh, I wish I had known about them before I did a lot of uh, social media campaigns that I had done. Make an account, uh, it's, it's very useful. As far as evaluating your progress, did you meet your goals that you set with your SMART plan? Um, if you didn't, why not? If you did, why did it work out? Um, in general, what went well, what didn't? And based on all of this, should you modify what you're doing and move forward? Should you just uh, plow ahead as planned? Uh, should you even continue what you're doing at all? Those are all questions that might arise throughout the advocacy process. Anyways, we're going we're gonna to go into some case studies that are kind of just based on my experience and, and what I've worked with, um, not necessarily initiated myself, but just have had access to. Um, first one here is the One Health Act of 2019 um, and the ad hoc committee working to further it. Uh, so the, the issue with this that we're trying to solve is to further integrate pandemic surveillance and preparedness efforts in the government. Um, we want to organize uh, 
or we have organized a political advocacy campaign to pass the One Health Act of 2019. And as far as all the partners involved, um, at our team, we have a small team representing a variety of um, trade groups that are relevant to the issue of disease preparedness and pandemic preparedness in the United States um, who meet regularly to try and, and work out how we can influence legislators and policymakers um, and other people of influence to support this and actually get it passed through Congress. Um, as far as campaign format, uh, it's basically been what I just stated as well as organizing what would be known as the grassroots campaign to try and mobilize people across the nation who would have interest in this issue, uh, like people who work in veterinary medicine, people who work in public health, uh, any of a variety of fields like that, to actually call their, their senators, call their Congress people, and tell them to support this legislation. And, and that can be very important. And is also why it's very important to manage your stakeholders and build your coalition because they would have access to a, a bunch of people who are members of their organization potentially that they can then mobilize and, and engage that you wouldn't have to worry about really, that you wouldn't have to put the time and effort into because that's something they already do anyways. Anyways, um, a lot of this stuff coming up from here is gonna be Iowa based. So I just want to say this, this state right here in red is Iowa, just for some context. The first one that we're going to talk about for that is uh, the Iowa Student Retention Incentive. Uh, the main issue here was there is brain drain, there is brain drain from the state where people will get their degrees in Iowa, get a uh, post-secondary education in Iowa, and then leave the state, which is, which is rather unfortunate. Um, so the, the strategy that myself and a couple other people took, I wasn't the person who started this effort, but I became one of the people who worked on it, um, was drafting policy and then advocating to um, lawmakers across Iowa to try and get this thing through Iowa's legislature. Um, as far as partners, uh, graduate professional student organizations across Iowa, and a quick note for international audience, um, like veterinary, pharmacy, medical students, uh, those aren't bachelor's degrees in the United States. Those are professional degrees that you uh, sometimes mostly uh, need a bachelor's degree to even begin. So it works a little bit differently here and that's what professional student means. Uh, as far as the campaign format, that was uh, you know direct outreach to, to people in government here in Iowa um, and a variety of other methods as well. Anyways, we started out um, by surveying over 2,000 graduate professional students across the state of Iowa. Um, that's kind of an anomaly because some people on the team were very well versed in statistics and survey writing. And uh, that was, that's not something you can expect every time, but if you can do it, that's great. Because being able to give numbers to uh, whoever you're trying to advocate to, um, and also basically charts and graphics with, with uh, colors those really, really work. People really, really like those. So if at all you can do that, do it. Um, then we spoke with these lawmakers about the issues and presented our findings from this survey. Uh, and uh, we gave them like brief one page summaries of it, uh, spoke with them, stuff like that. Uh, and then we began to draft legislation that could be introduced to Iowa's legislature. Now, unfortunately this didn't work out in the end because the financial ability of the state of Iowa uh, at the time had been sort of waning um, as far as their ability to, to fund an initiative like this, but it was still a great experience and a great introduction to legislative advocacy. Uh, so now we're moving on to the Iowa One Health Month proclamation that was previously mentioned in, uh, briefly <laughs> mentioned in my intro. Uh, as far as the issue, uh, it was just to make further recognition of One Health in Iowa. Um, we wanted to have the governor declare a One Health Day in Iowa, they actually ended up declaring a One Health Month rate. Um, and the partners were basically professional health schools in Iowa that were kind of backing us on this. They were, they were informal partners, but uh, people who were certainly interested nonetheless, stakeholders if nothing else. Uh, the, the whole campaign format, what we tried to do, what our plan was, was just directly reach out to the governor's office. There's actually a form you can fill out 
online for um, for what language you want to be in this proclamation, and then you can just you know click send. And it was agreeable. Uh, the governor will uh, print out a thing and sign it, and then it's officially endorsed by the governor, which is great. Um, and not always the case in a lot of other polities. Um, I've tried looking into this. I've tried looking into if you can do this in like Canada. I don't think you can. Uh, but if there are ways to do this in sort of uh, primary political subdivisions of other countries, like well, what states would be in the United States, um, that would be great. Uh, and our goal was to have the governor sign our proclamation, uh, which he did. And here's more stuff about that. Um, I was very fortunate that uh, people were able to just want to talk about themselves who attended this signing ceremony on Facebook. So we kind of got press just from that alone. And then the university did an article on it as well. Uh, and one thing that is actually going to be an, an important explanation of just the theory um, and giving some examples of what I'm talking about across this entire presentation is going to be in this instructional guide right here. So that's going to be important. And we'll send that out in an email later. Uh, next up was Clinician Suicide Prevention Day. And the, uh, the main issue with that was that uh, suicide is a common issue across many clinical professions. So uh, physicians, nurses, uh, dentists, uh, veterinarians, a, a wide variety of people. And it seemed that it would be beneficial for these groups to work together uh, in, in the in sort of the quest to ameliorate as much um, of the mental health and suicide burden as possible in a collaborative fashion. And um, so our partners naturally were going to be students and professional organizations from a variety of clinical professions. Uh, for the for the state of Iowa, at least, um, we wanted to have the governor declare a day of recognition, which he did. Um, and then we had a statewide moment of silence, and uh, that was on the coattails of a, of a webinar that was put on that was actually nationwide and planned by all of the major student organizations um, representing a variety of clinical professions. Um, and so, yeah, we, we reached out to the governor's office. We made press releases, uh, letters to the editor. Again, you should just always do that, uh, as well as social media posts. And that's the best letter to the editor here. We were also able to actually engage um, a major um, physician influencer. So if you can, you know, get social media influencers on your side, that's never a bad thing. Um, and we got an article written in uh, one of their websites. Uh, final one, uh, a little bit lighter. So the issue was food security, food insecurity in Iowa. Uh, the strategy was basically being monetizably ridiculous. Uh, and the partner was the Food Bank of Iowa. And the goal was basically over the month of October, which is National Pork Month in Iowa, uh, to raise $500 for the food bank. And so we were able to create kind of this common thread that I'm a vet student, I'm gonna be working with pigs. Uh, it's National Pork Month. And the entire idea of all of that is to have a safe and stable food supply for people. Uh, so it kind of made sense to tackle food insecurity in an in a interesting way as possible, as interesting way of a way as possible. So anyways, um, I pledged to run 20, I, I'm sorry, I, I pledged to run one mile for every $20 that was donated to this campaign. So we had a GoFundMe, uh, you could use Venmo to do it. Um, and that was a social media campaign that I really wish I had, uh, again, a Hootsuite for. Um, and, and, you know, I just took like pictures of people just took pictures of me. I took selfies running in this pig onesie. Um, and that was kind of the, the humor in all of it. Uh, and it got like a decent amount of traction with uh, the school, with um, the Iowa Veterinary Medical Association. Um, and it was really fun and really great. So you don't always have to be doing these serious uh, endeavors to promote a cause or to, to try and make change in society. Anyways, here's links and resources that I actually hope to add more to. Um, I realize a lot of the audience here is from Nepal. Bangladesh, Nigeria, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, and I, I've been trying to find resources for pursuing advocacy, political advocacy, 
or governmental advocacy in those respective countries. Um, and I've narrowed it down to a couple good ones, I think. But um, I, I wouldn't want to act at all like I, I know how advocacy works there. And thus, um, I just want to give a brief summary of uh, how it works in general, in theory, um, according to like the scholarship, and then just give some case studies for myself. Um, but with that, um, I guess we have the Q&A session. Uh, and thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Bailey and Neil, for your outstanding presentation. And I think our all attendees uh, get a glimpse of uh, advocacy on One Health. And also, they have got a clear idea about how they can uh, play the advocacy in their real life to implement the One Health issue. And uh, thank you again, our uh, great speaker, for your nice session, uh, Bailey, for your uh, elaborative session on One Health. Also, uh, Neil, you have discussed about two uh, case studies also with us for uh, knowing the details about uh, One Health advocacy. So now we are going to our uh, session's next step. Uh, we'll have some questions. Uh, first of all, we are uh, planning to ask you guys some question uh, from our Izoha team as a uh, Izoha webinar planner. I have some question from uh, my side. Uh, so I will, I think uh, you guys will ask, uh, uh, answer our questions. First of all, I would like to ask, uh, as you guys described the One Health advocacy issue, so how can we increase recognition of One Health in society and influence more institutions to adopt One Health approach. Like all of our institutions are not, are not uh, very uh, concerned about One Health approach. How can we make the, them to influence more in society to adopt One Health issue? So I think uh, Bailey or Neil, you can answer our questions. Thank you. Neil, do you want to start? Yeah, I can do yes, that. Yeah. Uh, so as far as how can we increase recognition of uh, One Health in society? I mean, that's, uh, that's there, there are many ways to do it, basically. Uh, again, you can try and, and get the government to recognize it in some way, shape, or form. Um, another way I didn't discuss quite so much um, so if originally for the Iowa One Health Month gubernatorial proclamation, um, the original concept of that was actually to uh, make a resolution, which is basically a non-binding statement of, of support or statement of uh, the sentiments of a legislative body um, that's, of course, representing, you know, a, a country, a state, whatever. Um, in the Westminster system, uh, so that's going to be like British Parliament and uh, a lot of other ones that inherited or, or sort of um, took inspiration from that system. The equivalent of that is going to be called an early day motion. And again, these are the things that um, don't authorize the government to do anything. They don't uh, allocate funding for anything. They're just a statement of uh, support or feeling from that legislative body. So especially if it's something that's worthwhile, that affects a lot of people, uh, like One Health, um, a lot of times uh, people will go for that and it, uh, it can get introduced to and then pass through uh, whatever legislative body you might have. Okay, that's yeah. great. I think Bailey, also, you want to add something? Yeah, um, I think you just have to help people know about One Health. I know that sounds very vague, but um, just thinking about how things work in the U.S., industry is a huge driver of um, policy. So essentially, like for example, if our agriculture trade associations and our agriculture industry, industry groups 
um, believed in One Health or spoke up about One Health, then there's a good chance that our lawmakers would listen to them. Because um, frankly, a, a lawmaker is more likely to listen to a industry group or a corporation than they are to me. Um, but you know, I could talk to that industry or corporation about a One Health approach. Um, so kind of le leveraging existing networks, um, leveraging important groups or people um, can be an important way to influence society um, and policy. That's great. So uh, as you guys said, first of all, we have to make aware the people about the One Health. This is the main thing. If they know about One Health, then they will uh, connect it with this issue and they will step forward to work on this issue. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have uh, one more question for you guys. Like uh, you all know that we are uh, passing a very hard time in worldwide. Uh, most of the countries like uh, developing countries and underdeveloped countries is going very, uh, very in uh, the unhealthy situation or very hard situations with COVID-19. So this is the time when we should uh, show our uh, youth advocacy or the power of the advocacy in real life. So uh, how can you continue advocacy during the time of COVID-19 when person opportunities are very limited. This will be a great question for our youths. Like all of our uh, youths and all other people have very limited resources and very limited opportunities. So how can we can continue our advocacy during these hard times like COVID-19? So I think it's important to remember that the COVID pandemic is sort of the quintessential example of why One Health is important since um, we're almost certain that COVID-19 originated in wildlife. So, uh, you know, lawmakers right now are talking about how can we prevent pandemics? How can we be prepared? How can we stop something like this from happening in the future? Um, and the answer really is a One Health approach. And that can manifest in a lot of different forms, like does it mean that we allocate more resources towards surveilling wildlife populations? Or does it mean that we focus on the kind of social sciences aspect of why do people um, interact with wildlife through wildlife trade and markets and things like that? Um, so I think you just have to contact people um, in influential positions, whether that's lawmakers or people in industry and corporations, um, contact them through whatever means you have available, whether that's you know email or writing a letter or asking to talk virtually like over video chat and um, just say, hey, COVID, um, you know, this quintessential One Health example is the reason that I can't talk to you about this in person right now. Um, yeah, so just, you know, using COVID itself as a One Health example um, while you're just connecting with them in whatever way is possible. Thank you, Bailey. Neil, you can add anything? Yeah, so kind of to build on what Bailey was saying, um, when you're basically building your, your support for whatever issue you're trying to tackle, um, and before you go to your uh, people in positions of power, this situation uh, in some ways makes it even a bit easier to build your base of support and to build your team uh, and just to engage and identify whatever stakeholders there might be. Because a lot of them are going to be on the internet more than ever. So you will be able to know more than ever where to find them. And if you're on any sort of forums on Facebook, Reddit, uh, or just have some kind of following or uh, know of some people on Twitter, they can contact. Then you can put out sort of hails for, are people interested in this thing? Uh, has anyone done anything about this yet? And that's how you can kind of find your people who are the most passionate and are gonna put the most work into it and be the most reliable. Uh, 
in addition to that, uh, it's a bit easier to set up meetings with them um, because, you know, just like our organization, just like Isoha, um, everything we do is via telemeeting, teleconference. And uh, there's a period of time where, you know, if, if you had someone who is not familiar with the technology, it wouldn't be so easy, it wouldn't be so feasible. But now, uh, you know, everybody who is going to be of some relevance to what you're going to want to do is likely going to have familiarity with, with Zoom, with Google Hangouts, with some kind of teleconference uh, technology, which makes things, of course, much, much smoother than even like a telephone call because you can send links, you can do screen sharing, uh, all these different things. So in a certain way, in conclusion, COVID-19 and the continued uh, virtualization of communication that it's created has, uh, has in a way opened up some opportunities further for connection and um, coalition building. Yeah. Thank you, Neil. So uh, that's the main point. Uh, we have to build, uh, as like uh, we are yacht and our yacht generation have to build a strong network with the, our uh, collaboration team, also with our stockholders, as we can link up the stockholder with the, our uh, society personnel who have not that uh, main access to them. So we can connect them to the stakeholders or we can connect our issues, big uh, problems to the stakeholders. So that's it. Uh, and also uh, one thing, uh, COVID-19 have uh, shown us that the human, animal and environment is uh, mainly uh, in one point. We are totally connected. So this is a, a big lesson for this world and also for the all people of the world. So thank you uh, for the questions and for the answers also. Now we'll take some questions from the audience. Uh, so uh, here's our audience are listening us. So if anyone uh, can want to ask anything, please raise your hand. I will unmute you guys. If anyone wants to ask anything, you can raise your hand or you can just unmute you and ask the question to the our speakers. I am uh, seeing uh, many attendees here. If anyone wants to ask anything, you can uh, ask. Or if you just have a comment or want to share about yeah, your own yeah. experience, you're welcome to raise your hand as well. Yeah, you can also uh, give a comment to the chat box, then I will uh, read your questions. And in addition to what, what uh, Bailey and Anna Sir said, again, I'm just really naive as to how the political process um, works in other countries and um, if anybody wanted to make any comments about if what I was talking about or what, what Bailey is talking about uh, is consistent with how you understand advocacy um, or uh, governmental advocacy lobbying to work in your country, or if it's completely different, um, maybe even more so, it would be awesome to hear about that. Yeah, I'm saying that on another look that Jenny is one uh, raise hand to ask any questions. So Jenny, you can ask question. You can just unmute yourself and then ask the question. Jenny, do you hear me? Jenny, you can unmute yourself and then you can ask question. It says she's muted by an organizer, so I think you're going to have to click her microphone first. 
I have unmuted her already. Okay, now she now stop now she should be able to unmute herself. There we go. Okay, okay. Uh, okay, uh, okay thank you. Can you hear me guys? Yeah, sure, sure, Anna. Okay, I'm very happy to be in this uh, webinar today. I have some questions uh, for President and Vice President and uh, all other our, our guests today. Uh, so I have a question that working with ISOLA, will you help in any perspective to work with international organizations or any of your career plan in future? Bailey, you got do the question? Do you mean um, like collaborating with other international organizations for like advocacy purposes? Is that what you mean? Yes, uh, I mean that uh, currently you were studying in veterinary science. Uh, so uh, probably or it's your goal to build up a career on veterinary medicine or in the subject. So will ISOA help you to build a career uh, on veterinary science in working with any other international organization as a career, not a patient or any volunteer work uh, as a professional life? I asked about it. So I think uh, I... Oh, yeah, no. yeah. Can I go ahead. Okay. Uh, so, if, if I'm understanding uh, your question correctly, um, and you know, feel free to stop me if it seems like I, I didn't. ISOHA is, uh, to the best of my understanding, this this would be something I'd want to double check with on Andreas to be completely sure. Um, we've been slowly building out our relations with um international organizations um including the people who were mentioned in the world health students alliance uh and for example i was actually able to attend um the world health assembly with the I, with ifmsa um and the world health assembly is, is the meeting of the who um and that's that's a great opportunity for meeting people making connections and so i was able to basically be representing ISOHA to IFMSA technically and then um, as part of IFMSA's sort of party or coalition that they brought to Geneva with them I was able to help represent them and, and youth students in health uh, worldwide to people who are making decisions on global okay. health policy okay. and we've had hey, talks hey. and stuff with OIE and stuff before as well so um, it's certainly something that's not outside of the realm of possibility. Yeah, sure. Hey, so, Eddie, uh, you want to add something? Yeah. Um, just a couple of months ago, ISOHA signed a memorandum of understanding with IBSA, the International Veterinary Students Association, uh, basically just to support each other, um, like publicizing each other's efforts and um, maybe collaborating on some things in the future. So we do have a pretty strong partnership with IBSA since Andreas, our president, um, was on their executive committee last year. Yeah. Uh, so, okay, thank you. I could understand. Uh, thank you yeah. so much. I, I want to add something. Like IBSA, IMFSA, uh, ISOHA, we all are uh, like uh, working some volunteer work to uh, our improve our skills and other issues like speaking issues like others on health issues we're uh, working for improving our skills so uh, these platforms are fully like volunteer work for us but uh, after uh, involving with these platforms and uh, these platforms will give us so much access and so much opportunities to apply others uh, in other platforms so these voluntary works will give us some skills and some opportunities to improve our uh, career skills. Like we can uh, do something in uh, future for our career, like we can uh, join uh, WHO, like FAO, uh, 
uh, by uh, see, uh, saying that uh, I have previously connected with Izoha, I have previously connected with IVSA. Uh, that's it. Like uh, I was a member, uh, I was a uh, member of the mentee or mentorship program of Izoha uh, last uh, last year, uh, previous year. So uh, now this year I am an executive member of Edu uh, Izoha Educational Team. So uh, in future I can do something more. So this is the opportunities. You can connect with Izoha and IBSA, others uh, voluntary organization. Then these opportunities will give you some access to uh, the keep uh, doing something big in your uh, career. That's it. Uh, thank you, Anona, for your nice question. And thank you, Bailey and Neil, for your answers. Uh, I would like uh, to take uh, one more or two more questions. If anyone wants to ask anything, uh, please raise your hand. Yeah, and or just going off of what Anissa just said, it's all about your network, right? So yes, if, yes. You know, if you're involved in these international groups, you know, even though our meetings are virtual and uh, we might not ever meet in, in person, it still gives you connections throughout the world yes. um, and can provide a lot of different opportunities career-wise. So that's important to keep in mind, um, you know, being involved can yes, uh, yes. help further your professional development, but also give you a stronger network for advocacy. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Like we are, we are connected with uh, a larger group, like international friend, like uh, me and Bailey, me and Neil are connected with each other. Uh, in person, maybe we are not connected, but in uh, online or uh, uh, many platforms like uh, Facebook, Twitter, and other platforms, we are connected. So we can exchange our opportunities. We can exchange our thoughts etc. So this will give us more opportunities to in future in our professional uh, platform or professional uh, skills development. So anyone want to ask anything or any question? Yes, uh, Paula Magber. Paula Magber, yes. Hi, uh, thank you to, are you able to hear me? Yeah, sure, sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you so so much to all presenters for the presentation today. It was very informative. Um, I just had a question about, uh, I know the presentations touched on it, but I had a question about um, referring to like advice on um, advocates advocating for One Health at a student level. So like in your own university environment, any tips or advice for um, increasing interest in generating engagement among like university students what university are you at um western university in ontario ah uh, okay um so your former president uh is now danny Kalani. Yeah, yeah 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 <laughs> um yeah he's now at you uh calgary oh. mm -hmm. so I guess there's a variety of ways to do it. How, how big do you feel your, your club is? And are, are there certain room, is there certain, are there certain venues you feel you have to expand into? Um, so right now the club, I believe is about, it's hard to gauge with this year. Um, getting enrollment has been challenging. So it's a, a little bit less than in previous years because of everything, all the club activities and everything being online. Um, but uh, I think we've had, somewhere in the ranges of 20s or 30s consistently um, in the past. And this year, we're trying to find ways and avenues to bridge and increase that, especially like because um, in past years, we had like in-person events, which was a good avenue to reach out to people and increase engagement. So with this year, it's been a little bit less than that. Yeah. And do you have how much support do you have from from faculty? Um, from faculty, we do uh, liaison with the One Health professors, and one of the uh, ongoing events that our VP of events is currently implementing is the, we're doing like a lecture series um, where we're getting different professors from different fields, not just like in the One Health faculty, to speak to their research and how One Health is actually um, being implemented. So we do have constant connections with the One Health professors, and we're trying to build um, connections with professors and other faculties. Okay. Um, I'm just trying to look at Western University's proximity to, um, oh wait, no, it's not that close. 
Uh, actually, would you happen to know off the top of your head what the closest One Health Club to you is? Um, the ones that I know we've uh, built like collaborations in the past was with was with uh, Guelph. I don't know if you mean like a student level or more national, but Guelph's One Health initiative and program, we've kind of had connections with them before. Oh my gosh, yes, 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 that's my bad. Um, oh, no. Yeah, you should definitely uh, form maybe, I would recommend trying to do some sort of a, a regional coalition with them because you also have a, a McMaster med school. Yeah. Or, yep. Um, and just a, a variety of other places to reach out to. Um, and I, I think Guelph's program has been looking, it, it's just very robust, um, I'm sure you know, and has a lot of faculty support. Yes, definitely. Um, and I think that they wanna get more into reaching out to like medical schools. And uh, I believe that there's some prominent ones in what, Hamilton, Toronto, Mississauga. So, those are all great venues and they're everything's within like what a uh, maybe two three hour drive if that mm. most things are yeah okay okay um yeah and, and for all the people here in general um forming uh just regional sort of partnerships and friendships with different uh clubs that are reasonably close is like a really good way to go um, basically to be able to pool resources and ideas and sort of decrease any any potential inefficiencies that you might have working separately. Um, but yeah, as far as increasing uh, immediately surrounding, increasing interest um, immediately surrounding you, uh, really hitting home the COVID thing could be a good sell as well because that's of course yeah very important mm -hmm. thank you so much yeah and well, also really know how that works out yeah it will do um i'm not sure how many different i guess colleges you have at western u but um one of the new north america continent representatives for isoha hannah Camelmaker um, has done a good job at the University of Georgia of um, expanding her One Health Club across different professions, um, you know, instead of just veterinary, since that's the one that has historically been the most represented. So if you want to connect with her and um, kind of pick her brain on how she's expanded her club across different departments and colleges and professions. Um, you can let me know and I can try to get you in with her if you'd like. Uh, yes, I, that'd be much appreciated. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, you both. Thank you, thank you, Paola. So anyone have any question? I, I, I think we can get uh, one more question, one last question from any of our participants. If anyone wants to ask anything, then I can raise your hand. If you don't have any question, uh, we are going to uh, next step to our uh, today's webinar. I think uh, there's no more question. We have more participants from different aspects of the world. So if you, anyone can ask anything uh, related to One Health, One Health Advocacy, IZOHA, or uh, uh, like anything, uh, you can ask. So Bailey and Neil, I think there's no question. So. I think we should go to the next step our uh, today's presentation. Uh, I would like to thank everyone uh, to our uh, joining our uh, today's webinar. Uh, I, I would like to thank every participants to join our webinars, and I would like to thank our uh, two great speakers to share for sharing their thoughts 
about student advocacy, uh, One Health, ISOHA, everything. And for their nice presentation and nice thoughts, we give a very uh, brief glimpse about uh, One Health advocacy, student advocacy. Uh, and uh, here are some email addresses uh, the, for the participants. If you want to uh, ask anything uh, after this session and any, uh, any anywhere, uh, for any uh, time, you can uh, email us or email in these uh, emails uh, and we'll uh, try to feedback your questions or answer your questions and we'll try to help you guys to uh, relating to ISOHA, One Health or uh, Student Advocacy in any issue, we'd like to uh, help you guys. Uh, so there's the question, you can screenshot them. Also, uh, you can email them uh, for further queries. Uh, that's it. And uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, One Health Commission for giving us such opportunities in this uh, GoToWebinar platform. Uh, we have used GoToWebinar platform uh, for uh, the webinar series. Uh, our first webinar series was performed in Zoom account and our uh, second and third webinar uh, is performed in uh, GoToWebinar uh, platform. And One Health Commission gives us uh, the, gave us the access in this platform and for this opportunity we can uh, run this great session today and in previous day we have also run a great session with this platform so thank you again one health commission uh, for giving us such opportunities and we think in future you can uh, collaborate uh, more uh, webinar sessions with this platform uh, thank you uh, everyone uh, for joining us again and thank you our great speakers for joining this platform so that's it for this session. If anyone uh, want to say anything, you can say. So uh, for today, uh, we are saying goodbye to everyone. Uh, take care of yourself and stay safe and healthy in this COVID-19 situation. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks for coming. All right. Are we still recording? Uh, no, I think I think our session is end, and now I can uh, stop recording. Bailey. Yeah, you can stop recording now. Okay. Some of our